Great, thank you, uh, Laura, very much for that introduction. And hi, everyone, it's nice to see you all. Um, I um, am really pleased to introduce our speaker tonight. And uh, as I was just sharing with uh, Fernanda, I, you know, I have to admit, I have really enjoyed um, all of the Hidden Truths um, speakers and the series so far, and I've been just really proud of the, the work that our faculty have done and um, the great discussions we've had so far. But I have to admit, I have a special interest in um, tonight's presentation and I'm really looking forward to it. I was a Latin American studies major in college and um, spent much of my career teaching and doing research about Latin America. And I taught Latin American studies for many years. Um, and so I uh, expect that the, the topic of um, uh, tonight's presentation will be familiar to me, but I'm sure I'm also gonna learn uh, some, some new and interesting things and really deepen my thought, uh, my thoughts uh, about uh, race, race relations and comparative race relations. And as uh, Dean uh, Jason Jacobs was just reminding us all, it's very timely uh, on, our, um, on our campus as we embark on an anti-racism uh, campaign and some really deep uh, collective work uh, around um, anti-racism, uh, which uh, I know we're all very energized uh, by and looking forward to. Um, I always uh, found in my own experience that teaching uh, American students um, about race and racial discourses in Latin America is not only, of course, an important facet of understanding the historical, social, and economic landscape of that region, but also I, I found it to be a very powerful way to provide students with a comparative perspective on the construction of race in the United States. Um, and as I'm sure you'll hear tonight, uh, Brazil provides a particularly important, complex and contested understanding of the social construction of race. So it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Fernanda Rigi. Uh, Dr. Rigi is a lecturer in Spanish at RWU where she also teaches Latin American and Latino studies and gender and sexuality studies. Her research and teaching interests cover 20th and 21st century Latin American literatures and culture with a focus on Argentina and Brazil. More specifically, she is currently working on teaching Afro-Latin, La, excuse me, La, Afro-Latin American cultures and authors in Latin American studies courses and Spanish language and culture courses. So with that, I, I welcome uh, Dr. Rigi and look forward to her presentation. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, um, Provost Everett, for the nice presentation, and also uh, the organizers, um, Laura Turner, uh, Laura Damore, and uh, Jason Jacobs for reading our proposal and for putting uh, this series uh, together. Um, so, and also thank you so much to everyone for being here <laughs> tonight. Um, I'm going to, uh, I have a presentation, so I, I'm going to uh, share with you. Okay, presentation is not here. Now it is. Mm -hmm. So, so could you see it? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so the title of my talk is uh, this case, uh, discussing racial democracy in LALS course. And basically what I am going to present today before introducing this concept is um, I am going to present the, a unit of Afro-Latin American studies, which is part of my research and, um, and teaching interest, especially in this part of, of my career um, after my PhD and how I teach it in um, introduction to uh, Latino and Latino studies course, which is a course that is um, um, mandatory for folks that uh, decided to do the minor and core concentration in Latin American and Latino studies, but also it can be uh, done as a core 102 course. So, um, so it was very interesting because the, the class has a lot of, um, of different interests and um, 
Yeah, and I really, and, and that the discussions were really interesting and variety. You know, it comes from from different fields. So this is the structure of my talk today. I say hola to everyone. So I'm going to start by introducing one of the core concepts of uh, of my class and how uh, this is going to help. Um, um, yeah, to organize the course in general. Then I'm going to uh, go over the materials that I use to teach, uh, the things that uh, students uh, read and discuss. So I'm going to do like very like a very small part because of uh, issues of uh, connected to to the to the time. Then I'm going to discuss the concept of racial democracy as it was understood in Brazil. And then I'm going to go to uh, to some conclusions. So. One of the fundamental concepts in Latin America and Latin American and Latin, uh, yeah, Latin American studies is um, this idea that was presented by um, Argentinian <laughs> anthropologist Walter Mignolo uh, in uh, his book, Idea of Latin America. That is, that basically what he, um, basically what he discussed, okay, what he distinguished is um, the subcontinent, you know, this, Piece of land, <laughs> to uh, to say it uh, to say it in a way, he separates the this part of the world from the idea of how this part of the world was conceived since colonial times. So he says that basically the idea of Latin America, this um, identity of Latin America in relation to Europe, contributes to the foundation of what was the West and uh, and modernity. A West and modern world, and uh, and he claims in this in this book that the Americans are a consequence of European expansion and uh, the European perspective of that expansion. So, basically, uh, what he tries to recover is like some other perspectives, right? Um, so, as an instructor, to me, starting reading uh, this text um, was really important because somehow set the tone and some of the questions that we are going to address in every material that we that we read or that we watch. So um, somehow these are some of the questions that guide our discussions in general, not only in the unit that I am going to focus today. So uh, since the very beginning of the course, we uh, conceived that the colonized project created different identities, some of them that were silenced and dehotorized, and some of uh, and some others that were strengthened. So some of the questions that, that I um, that you know students and we all ask right to uh, to the text and the materials in general. So it's like which groups impose, impose their perspective, which groups were absent. Or if they are not absent, how are they represented? How are they named in, in certain documents um, or in certain, uh, yeah, certain documents in certain materials? And, and this is a question that I got from, um, from a Brazilian philosopher that, that, is, that is quite famous uh, right now, that is Damila Ribeiro. Like who was authorized to speak in this, um, in this project of colonization. So basically what she uh, claims in, 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 in her book, which sadly is not translated to English, and this is the first challenge that I have in choosing the material for this course, is basically what is the place of a speech of the person who is writing the text, creating the material, and which places of a speech are basically the authorized. So, um, So this is what I am trying to address in every every material that I work for or that I propose for this course. So this is somehow you know the main structure, right? Kind of like um, for the course. So now I would like to move to the second part, more specifically to uh, Afro Latin American studies, which is a part of 
uh, of this course is more or less around uh, a little bit more than a week. And uh, the materials that I have here are uh, specifically three. One is the um, is this book, uh, Afro Latin American Studies and Introduction. This is a book in 2018 by Alejandro de la Fuente and George uh, Ray Andrews. We read the introduction of this book. Then we watch the documentary Black in Latin America, Part Three: Brazil, a Racial Paradise, and finally. Uh, a group of students read the biography of um, representative uh, from the state of Rio de Janeiro uh, in Brazilian Congress, uh, Benedita da Silva, an Afro-Brazilian women's story of politics and love, which is written by uh, Benedita da Silva and translated by uh, the other person. So, what is important to me about the materials, and this is something that I specifically learn here at Roger Williams is that uh, the um, most of the materials are in this course are either um, they are open educational resources so they do not represent an extra charge to students that take the class so so to me that that is something really important and this is something that somehow guide also uh, my teaching choices of the material. So in the first case here, this book, uh, we read the introduction of this book that is um, uh, published by uh, Cambridge University Press. So, and it is a lot, I mean, you can download it from their, from their website. So, and then in the second case, uh, so that is like, oh, I believe that it's much more OER because it's available to everyone. This, in the second case, Black in Latin America, this is a documentary that is available on a Canopy. So actually, it, it's not open ed. It's not something that is open to everyone, but at least um, students do not need to purchase something else because they, it is it is included, uh, it is material from the university. So and in the last case, the only thing that in this case the students need to buy is the, the, the last book. But only one group of students are going to, um, to buy it, right? I'm going to explain this a little bit later. So, um, so I'm going to uh, start first with uh, the first material, which is um, the introduction uh, like the first class that we discuss Afro Latin American studies. So this is a, an academic test. Um, the, the title of the test is The Making of the Field Afro Latin American Studies, and it's written by the authors of uh, the editors of this collection, Alejandro La Fuente and George uh, Reed Andrews. So the main objective for reading this text is to contextualize the idea of racial democracy. And um, to contextualize how this term emerged and basically to distinguish from other ways of studying social relations in Latin America, especially after the abolition of slavery. So um, what I specifically, one of the questions, so I, 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 there, there is a whole study guide um, to read this text, but one of the main things that I want to highlight for this presentation is that students should distinguish between what it was considered scientific, what is uh, called scientific racism versus the idea of racial democracy. So, and how one, one and the other were different, right? So, um, so we can observe that after the abolition of the slavery, especially in Brazil, but also for instance, in Argentina and also Chile, um, emerged this idea of scientific racism of study racial relations. So uh, the idea basically in this case is to demonstrate the biological foundation of racial differences and to observe racial mixing as something negative. As, basically social degeneration. So kind of like it tend to separate uh, races on races in, um, on the one hand, but also this type of approach tend to um, justify white leadership, 
right? So in contrast, so this more or less, this was the tendency of studying uh, racial relations kind of like by the beginning of the 20th century. And then in contrast, around uh, the 1920s and the 19, uh, especially in the 1930s and after, um, several organizations and reformists demand more participation in, uh, in the government and in the politics of the country, right? So there was a big discussion connected to the idea of democracy, right? Who, uh, who is governing, who is governing, who is in power? So, and there was also some national pressure, uh, pressure to study racial formation with models coming from Latin America and not from other places. So this kind of like two, um, two tendencies come together in order to, uh, um, they, they come together and as a consequence, they produce um, academic work connected to the idea of racial democracy, of understanding countries and nations as, as racial democracies. So, um, the positive aspect of um, considering countries as racial democracies is that uh, they consider the contributions of different people to uh, the formation of the nation, right? So kind of like, oh, okay, we have different groups and the cultures of these groups actually are part of our national identity. So, um, and in contrast to the, the previous time, um, they highlight racial medicine as something typical from Latin America. So, um, so I think that these are the two main ideas. So basically what this idea permits is like uh, further studies on indigenous and um, Afro-Latin American cultures in Latin America. So, and this, for instance, happened during the Afro-Brazilian conferences in 1937 and also during 1940s. So, but this is what I said, this is an academic test. The objective of this is to basically contextualize how um, Afro-Latin American studies changed over the course of the 20th century. And then specifically, I also want to focus a little bit more on the concept of racial democracy that I was um, saying um, before. It is a concept that was, uh, the idea was born in the 1930s, but actually in relation to Brazil, will appear first in, in 1941. Uh, it appears in English. So that is something that, that to me was, uh, was really curious because somehow it sparks the uh, the conversation, you know, the comparative conversation between, in this case, Brazil and the United States. Uh, it appears in this journal that is still published uh, today, Journal of Negro Education, but uh, at the University of uh, Howard in 1941, in an article that was written by uh, the anthropologist, Brazilian anthropologist Arthur Ramos in English. The idea is basically of this concept is to describe an idea of equality among people. So uh, this is the article, this is the first, um, the first page of this article that I have it and if somebody is interested, I mean, I, I can share it. So um, in this article, basically the objective of Arthur Ramos was to uh, summarize um, uh, in a very short article, <laughs> the ideas and arguments presented by uh, Gilberto Freire uh, in Casa Grande Sen Sala, or in English, The Masters and the Slaves, that was published in 1933. And they basically highlight uh, racial mixture as something, uh, as a feature of Portuguese America, right? Um, and to describe uh, how this feature from the colony actually um, somehow characterized Brazil um, or somehow determined the future of, uh, of Brazil as a nation, 
right? Um, so I am going to now highlight um, this part. So by the end of the article, Arthur Ramos decided to compare Brazil racial relations with other countries in the world at the time. So one is uh, he compared with the US, but he also compared it to Germany. So I'm going to quote. So I don't think therefore that the situation of, uh, wait a minute, I have it here because I, I cannot see because of the Zoom. I don't think therefore that the situation of the Brazilian Negro is connected with the destiny of the so-called democracies in the world. In Brazil, we have one of the purest racial democracies in the Western hemisphere. And then he continues. So for, uh, fortunately, we have our own philosophy of life as opposed to the theories of, uh, of the master race. But we ask this question whether the treatment of the races by the English has been better than the Germans. In any case, we don't want to perpetrate a status quo in their democratic and this in very commas is from, uh, from Ramos, treatment of the minorities in the world. And basically, and she end, and he ended. So the Negroes in Brazil do not need any other philosophy to substitute for their own. They ask only that they be left alone in their own surrounded to continue an old tradition of freedom, tolerance, and liberty on Brazilian soil. This is basically how the article um, finishes. So what we can observe here is that Arthur Ramos present uh, well, Brazil, as he said, purest of racial democracy in contrast to other countries such as the US and Germany. So basically, the concept of racial democracy appears to show the absence of racial democracy and the absence of racial democracy and failure of democracy values in the countries of the North, we can say, uh, in this case, he said English colonies, that's what he uses, English former colonies and Germany. Um, and then also to uh, reinforce the idea of democracy in Brazil, even at a time of a dictatorship. So, because let's remember in 1937, um, it's the beginning of the Estado Novo. So, and, and very curiously, I mean, besides all the parties being prohibited, yeah, one of the parties uh, that is uh, the Frente Negra Brasileira, which is um, Brazilian Black Front, I think it is, uh, uh, the translation was also prohibited. So among many other parties, right? So I really, I mean, what I read here is that basically Ramos is somehow operating <laughs> Uh, in favor of this type of, uh, of, of government, right? Of showing uh, uh, the world um, that Brazil has achieved some kind of like equality among people, even though it is not in a democratic setting. I, I don't know. So, so to me, that, that, was, um, that was really curious that, the, that this concept appears in English and appears at this time of Brazilian history and at this time of the global history in general. So, so this is something that we, um, that we discuss in class. And also uh, it allows us to move to the second material that, uh, that we discuss, which is uh, this documentary, uh, which is part of a bigger series. It has several parts. We only watch part three for, for this course. Um, it will actually be great to, to see others, uh, to other parts as well. Uh, so it says, uh, the name is Black in Latin America, part three, Brazilian Irracial Paradise. So kind of like students by only seeing the title, they can see that, okay, so somebody is going to question, <laughs> to question this idea. And um, this is a documentary. It is something, it, it is different, of course, from the academic test. Um, and, uh, and in this documentary, I think that it is shown the complexities uh, within Brazil. So, and it focuses on this a specific country that we are going to uh, continue studying for the rest of the unit. So in this documentary, 
um, that is by PBS. Uh, we have Professor uh, Henry Gates uh, Jr., who is a professor of history and African American studies at Harvard University. That he explores, explores Brazil, and he also puts himself in a position of learner, even though he is a specialist. Um, I, I really like this position that he assumes in the documentary because it is um, it lets some other people talk, uh, especially in, in Brazilian history, especially, um, especially but, uh, but other people as well, like activists, um, people connected to Brazilian culture. And um, and he, he makes those comparisons between Brazil and the US. So I think that that, that, is, that is really important actually, because he let the people speak and then he made the comparison. So, you know, this is in the, so he, he's all the time making these comparisons, which to me is really, uh, is really important. So the main activity that I want students to do while they watch the documentary is that explore arguments in favor and against the idea of Brazil as racial democracy, right? So kind of like we don't abandon the idea of racial democracy yet, but uh, let's try to see why, you know, uh, some intellectuals before um, presenting this concept as something characteristic of Brazil. So, um, so in favor, what we can observe is that um, we, we observe in the documentary the first, uh, the, the same issue that Arthur Ramos and Gilberto Freire present, which is basically um, racial mixture and the possibility of, of interracial marriages, for instance, during even during Brazilian uh, colonial history and in, in, this, in this opportunity. Professor uh, Gates goes to Diamantina in Minas Gerais, in which where um, free slave Chica da Silva married uh, Joao Fernandes de Oliveira, um, who was a white man owner of one of the mines uh, in Minas Gerais. Uh, and they had together 13 children. And they live, uh, I mean, their marriage was not something uh, secret. So, and this possibility also allows them to think about uh, how interracial marriages were more accepted um, in Brazil rather than in other places. So that is the first comparison. And then the other thing that is more connected to maybe the law, it is that um, they were not, segregations, uh, they were not segreg uh, segregation laws in Brazil. So, but this is something also very tricky um, because um, what we see is that um, what is important to know about the law and racial differences in Brazil is that the Republic of Brazil um, after the abolition at the beginning of the Republic and like it was constructed uh, by what is called uh, over erasure science. And what does it mean? So it means that abolition meant the, meant the end of a system that legitimized the racial inequality, allowing somehow formal or legal equality among all individuals. So in the constitution of 1891, uh, in Brazil they established um, legal equality among the individuals. Uh, eliminating, for instance, terms like preto or negro of official documents. So allowing somehow of formal equality that ended up permitting discriminatory practices, uh, ideologies of widening, and then scientific racism as we have seen in the previous slide. So uh, it is true, there was no, uh, basically the idea of racial democracy was also connected to that. Right to the to the fact that there were no uh, laws that separate uh, or divide individuals. So, but then in contrast, what we have seen uh, is that there are many practices or many uh, structural issues that somehow tend to uh, have 
similar consequences. In, in this opportunity, Professor Gates go to um, uh, Sidra de Deus, which is um, a favela in, also in Rio, is one of the biggest favelas in Brazil. And uh, one activist and rapper from the favela says that, okay, so if you see around here, most of the people who live here are actually black. So I cannot believe that this is, you know, just a coincidence, you know. Um, so there should be, um, there are less opportunities uh, for black people in Brazil. So, um, so this is one of the issues that the documentary explored and it explores and also um, education. So that in the documentary, they observed that most of the people that go to Brazilian universities are white. Most of professors are also white. So there is some kind of like impediment of accessing to of higher education. So, and also in this case, they discuss the policy of quotes uh, in Brazilian federal university that permits uh, or the benefit some students um, that come from uh, low income families, black families, and also indigenous families. So that, um, that is something that we also discuss, uh, discuss in class. So the idea basically is to make a comparison, right? To put the arguments on one side and then put the arguments in, in the other side and see how, um, um, how, how they are different. And also it, what is also curious is like who were in favor of some documents, some uh, who were in, in favor of the idea of racial democracy and who were like against it. So we, we could observe that. So, um, and then lastly, um, so I propose uh, a different type of activity that I call a book club which is basically an activity that was connected to, uh, to COVID <laughs> because um, I taught this class for the first time in fall 2020. And, um, and, and, and it was really hard to create groups because especially, you know, some students were in the classroom, others were outside. Um, in many cases, I had the feeling that they, they don't know each other very well. So I uh, intently proposed this type of activity in which a group of, um, in this case, there were five students, they read, they read a book um, and they present it. Uh, they present it to the rest of the class and they propose some, um, some question for discussion. So um, in this unit, so the students, you know, other groups read um, uh, other books for other units. Oh, in this unit, we are reading this. Uh, this is a biography of a uh, representative and, and then senator um, in a Brazilian National Congress. Actually, she was uh, the first Black woman to, uh, to enter Congress. So... Uh, and this is basically her biography. So here, you know, I think that it was really important to introduce her perspective because the other two materials, I think that are, the first one is exclusively academic. Then the second one, I mean, there are more voices, but here I think that, uh, that this perspective, despite, you know, it is somebody, you know, in power, um, it is some, somebody also that have lived all her life uh, or most of her life uh, in a favela and then she entered into activism and then ended up uh, in Congress. So, um, so I think that, that that type of position I think is really important. I think that as Sueli Carneiro, which is another Brazilian intellectual analyzed uh, the history of Black women in power is a history of absence. So because it refers actually to very few women who have, uh, that could achieve that, um, that status. And they say, and when they, and they achieve it, 
they uh, actually have to endure a lot of a lot of racism. Um, and especially the case of Benedita, she was the first one, right? So this is some of the things that student highlights. They highlight uh, some experience experiences uh, that this author described in the book, like for instance, being discriminated even when, when she was a child and also when she was uh, like in Congress, how she was, how for instance, media um, questioned certain practice, practices of her, like for instance, going using VIP um, rooms at the airport. And, it, and I found it funny because, I mean, if you're a senator, I mean, all senators go there, right? All senators use those, uh, those rooms, right? Uh, or you, they use those kind of privileges. But they question Benedita used in this type of, of, of services that are actually available for, every, for all the people in her position. So, and then what I especially like, um, what I especially ask students to, uh, to work on is, um, is again, this issue of racial democracy. So the idea of reading this book is that this book actually repeat in the biography, like the author connect um, or repeat several issues that we have already seen. And also it allowed us to connect to the, less, the next topic that is um, feminism in Latin America. So kind of like the next unit. So, but, specifically focus on racial harmony, uh, Benedita talks about a myth of racial harmony. And in the book, she says that uh, racial democracy uh, is an idea imposed by the Brazilian elite. So black community cannot seek for reparation. I, I really don't know what it says there. Yeah, cannot claim or seek for reparations or affirmative action policies. So what Benedita is saying here is, ideas that were also developed during uh, the 20th century by, for instance, sociologist Ralston Fernandez and uh, Abdias do Nascimento, were both Brazilian, uh, Brazilian intellectuals that challenged the idea of racial democracy, saying that not only was a false idea, not only was a lie, but it was also a form of um, domination by, um, by Brazilian elites that somehow prevent the formation of a black movement. So, and then Abdias do Nascimento actually kind of like goes into the same way, but also he, uh, he added to this argument that somehow it prevented to black folks to, or black people to develop uh, um, racial identity and racial, um, yeah, racial identity. So right now, kind of like the issue of racial democracy moves from um, why the United States was, were not a racial democracy to why Brazil doesn't have a black movement uh, uh, like, uh, like the Black Panthers. I think that many of them were having, um, we're having like that model because actually in the 1970s, there were uh, many organizations, especially of black women that, that appear in Brazil. So they, some of them were, were regional, so and they operate. Uh, let's remember that in the 70s, there was um, uh, kind of like the hardest part of, uh, of the second dictatorship in Brazil. So, but they were still meeting in, uh, in the different states uh, of Brazil. So, um, okay. So, and this is basically uh, the part that students uh, in this group decided to explore and uh, propose for the discussion. Um, okay, propose for the, discussion of uh, the whole class. So the issue of representation and black women in politics. So um, this is a part that I, that I really like because I also, the only thing that I say to students is like, okay, next unit is about feminism. So, so kind of like let them uh, explore this topic uh, on their own. So what they decided to do is uh, to inquire about the participation of black women uh, as political candidates. 
um, uh, especially in uh, in in the last elections. So uh, students bring the cases of. For instance, Renata da Silva Sosa, which was elected deputy in 2018, and also the case of uh, Marielle Franco, who uh, was elected in 2016 uh, for Rio de Janeiro City Council, but there was murder um, with um, her driver in 2018. So what they actually, this is something that they proposed. I have never mentioned <laughs> Marielle to them, so I was actually um, um, I was actually really, uh, really happy that they mentioned all, all this activism that was around uh, Marielle's dead and this uh, demand uh, for justice. Um, so, uh, so they were curious, kind of like they, this was kind of like a question that was posed by them uh, that if uh, all this activism that surround uh, the assassination of Marielle actually uh, fostered the participation of Black women in politics. So we have seen that data actually shows an increase uh, in participation of Black women uh, candidates from 2018 to 2020. So, um, so we, we have seen that, you know, data shows that we just want, we don't know why, you know, there are many hypotheses, many of them, some of them are connected to, uh, to actually the organization of, uh, of, um, of, black, of black women, yeah, from a black women organization and how this, of this articulation between individual experiences and uh, political discourse and activism, right? So what we, what I brought, uh, for instance, uh, I, I had an article from uh, Deledes, uh, which is an Institute of uh, Black Women uh, from Brazil that actually present this as one of the main hypotheses of you know, the involvement of Black women in politics. Um, um, but then, in this opportunity, because it was fall of 2020 and actually was close also to November, many students decided to comment on also participation of Black women uh, of poly in, in US politics and how um, this is the first time many of them comment on the election of Kamala Harris and, um, but also how they were, for instance, very few women in, uh, very few black women in in Congress, in or as governors here um, here in the U.S. So, a, a kind of like the conversation uh, also goes into that. So, kind of like the spirit of uh, the comparative spirit of the concept of racial democracy somehow uh, continues over the course, and and I was really. Um, uh, and I was um, really happy and engaged uh, to see that this is uh, one of the topics that uh, that interests um, students. So I'm running out of time. So uh, I'm going to uh, go to some final remarks and we can continue the conversation. So I have just focused on three main issues, the issue of uh, decolonial studies as an approach to include in inter disciplinary courses such as the intro to Latin American and Latino studies that focus on the destruction of indigenous culture and also the enslaved of African peoples. The concept of racial democracy to observe and discuss how racial relationships were constructed in national contexts and how, how they differ from one country to the other one. I think it is important to include um, maybe in, in teaching this type of introductory courses. Um, there is no, the concept of racial democracy is no longer discussed in research, I would say, uh, because nobody claims that there is a, a, an actual a, or a purest <laughs> racial democracy like Arthur Ramos used to say. But, um, but I think it's a very interesting discussion to include in some of these courses. 
and then also more a pedagogical purpose in which uh, the students proposal like combining combined guided and open activities and discussions uh, in our classes. I would say that after this experience, I am I am opening and opening and opening more um, the activities, allowing students to even choose their own materials. You know what they want to 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 present and what they want to uh, to share, but. To me, I mean, personally, it was a, a, a good way to start because I see that this um, um, how, has worked uh, really well uh, in my class. So I would like to thank you very much, uh, everyone, for staying with me until now. And I am open to any questions or comments that, uh, that you may have. Um, and thank you so much uh, for listening to me. Thank you so much for that, Fernanda. And I am going to now then turn it over to our moderator for the evening, Dr. Autumn Quezada Grant. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat and Dr. Quezada Grant will um, pass them on to Dr. Riki. You're on mute, Dr. Quesada Grant. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm Autumn Quesada Grant, and uh, um, I'm a Latin American historian. And I have to say, Fernanda, I am bursting with excitement over this particular topic and how you approached it and how you teach how you're teaching it in the class. But um, I will let others ask questions. Um, so I want to open it <laughs> to others. Thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, this is this is so important to me as a <laughs> you know, as a younger scholar. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. So do we have any questions from the group? Um, since, since no, I'll, I'll get us started a little bit here. I really liked the synergy that you were trying to get the students to think about, about how within Brazil, Brazil itself was trying to come to terms with its own identity. As you know, are we a racial democracy? You know, like who's in control of the narrative, like you're talking about, but also that they're pointing the finger at the United States, right? They're saying, you have segregation, we don't. So we therefore must be a racial democracy. So we, we're not discriminatory, right? So how did the students react to thinking about that? Um, thank you so much for that question, because I was thinking that um, uh, in 20, 2020 was, was a really, I think a special year for a lot of the students. I have observed in, in previous years that there was some reluctance to, um, to discuss uh, racial issues, especially from white students. That they, there is some kind of like discomfort, like, oh, okay. Or in many cases, sometimes I see, oh, okay, racism is something from the past or not from the present. So they used to say that. I could say that in 2020, and, and I believe that it was because of um, uh, George Floyd that and all the, also all the um, all the demonstrations that were uh, that, that that also happened over that summer. I think that the the context somehow the context here in the U.S. somehow set. Um, uh, Kind of, kind of like students, I don't know if they were ready to discuss the topic, but I think that there was like an increasing interest in, uh, in discussing topics like this. Um, so in, this, in discussing racial issues, because in many cases they, they didn't have the opportunity to do it before. Many of them were uh, first year students. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that also the comparative approach um, it says, okay, it was not in all places the same. Um, 
So, uh, so yeah, I don't think that I, in personally in this class, I mean, I didn't have like any students saying like, oh yeah, racism is something from the past. No, nobody says that <laughs> in, the, in the class. Somehow they were, um, I mean, it's clearly not something that they like, but they say it's something that I believe that, okay, we are accepting this fact from this country. What, what can we do? I think that there is much more like um, eagerness to discuss and eagerness of how, how they can change that, right? So they, I think that, uh, that I have observed that students want to be like agents of change. Like, okay, so what can I do, you know? Um, so I really don't know what is going to happen in the future. I believe that it was something that it was very connected to the context uh, of this country. It's also especially connected to the elections and, uh, and that most of the students not liking uh, the former president. So they, they were very openly against, I mean, they, um, they even say it in class. So, um, so I think that they were uh, in, interesting, uh, interested uh, in, 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 discussing, uh, in discussing this unit. So that, that was something that, that happened back in 2020. I believe that is something that, it, that is still going on. So hopefully it will, it will, it will continue. Right, right. So Sue has a question. And I think um, what is very important, again, to reiterate what you're talking about is that the racial democracy actually erased um, racial identity, right? And so it, it prevented people from coming, like, to have a unified movement, like you were talking about the Black Panthers, for instance. So as with George Floyd, so you begin to see, for instance, this leads to Sue's question here, you actually see the Black Lives Matter movement happening in Brazil, right? Whereas under this facade of, of racial democracy, it couldn't happen. So Sue asked the questions, asked the question, are students surprised about racial and gender discrimination outside the US? I, I really don't think that they were surprised. <laughs> no, no. I what I have seen, like very honestly, I have seen like a lot of pessimism in my students. Like sometimes I think like 18 years old, like, oh, this is not going to change. Like sometimes they are like this. And and I was like, hey, you're 18. Come on, come on. <laughs> and they are like, uh, but yeah, they see this as something really plausible. Uh, to to happen in other places the actually black like black life matter i think that nowadays is somehow um um like a statement that was translated into portuguese like vida negra is important and exactly. and that in many in many demonstrations uh you can see uh you can see the banners uh yes. especially in the case in also in cases of police brutality so. Exactly right, and so you see, whenever with the police brutality, if someone is murdered, you know, they, it, Brazil's taken a cue from the U.S. with that. Um, are there any other questions from anyone? Okay, Paula, uh, have you introduced Maria Silva in the course? Marina, sorry, my glasses. What are your thoughts about how she might complicate the understanding of black women in politics in Brazil, her, her into the discussion, given her role as formal environmental minister and formal presidential candidate? So have you introduced her as a, a yeah. Have you introduced her into the course? Yeah, actually, I mean, actually I don't. I mean, and I think that she should be uh, I think that it, it should be like, it would be really interesting this connection between Benedita da Silva and also Marina Silva as a former uh, environment, as a former member of uh, PT. And now that she is like somehow outside it. Um, so yes, I think that, yeah, I think that it, it would be interesting to uh yeah to introduce also her her role because they appear more or less at uh during the same time and and they come from very different places because 
Marina is coming from activism, uh, activism in the Amazonia and connected to environmental issues, whereas uh, Benedita is coming from the favela and uh, women organization within the favela. So they are actually pointing to very two very different projects uh, in Brazil. I think that it would be really interesting to actually there is another unit unit on the Amazonia, but I um, I focus a little bit more on the beginning of the century and um, and the rubber boom. So I think that I should introduce now. You know, I'm I, I am I am thinking aloud. <laughs> So I am thinking that probably I should introduce Marina Silva's activism there, you know, in that unit and not so much maybe. And then, you know, maybe a students can make, you know, can make this connection, but I believe that, um, that yes, that, that this could be like, uh, like a nice place for her, uh, for her to be like, maybe she commend this and then, uh, and then Marina Silva as well. So I think that this could be like a very nice connection to do. So I need to find material in English. This is a major challenge, I have to say. <laughs> okay, Jason asked me put my, my glasses on where I can really see. Seems like there are interesting comparisons to be made between racial democracy and what we see in Republican led states in the United States. Hmm. Good question. Where legislations ban, legislation bans or seeks to limit discussions on race and the history of racism, right? Using a language of equality that seems like it's saying the right things, but it is of course mainly intended to forestall any anti-racist discussions. Yeah, I, I was actually, uh, yeah, I saw that a comment the other day on, and I was thinking that, okay, actually not speaking about race also bring pro it's also problematic you know it's like it seems to me that uh, that the us could actually learn from that experience you know like erasing race or, or not discussing it or or not allowing this interaction between uh, black activism or black identity groups and in this case, the estate actually prevent, uh, actually did, to say it quickly, I mean, didn't solve any problem, actually, <laughs> actually increase it and increase it even more. Because uh, nowadays in Brazil, I mean, the issue of race is something, uh, well, especially with this administration, um, is, is very visible, you know, especially, you know, using social media and alternative, uh, an alternative means there is like a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of discussion and, con and con they use in social media to contest uh, like the mainstream discourse or the discourse from, from the government, I would say. Mm. So yes, I was thinking of exactly about that. Like, no, I was thinking, no, don't go there. It doesn't work. <laughs> Right. I was going to say, and I think because uh, I had mentioned to Laura, I was like, there's a comment under uh, and maybe for those who didn't see the comment was after this was posted that this was going to happen. The comment was the best way to talk about racism is to not talk about it at all. Right. So to get right. This is exactly gets to Jason's comment there, but we went searching for it. We couldn't find it. So luckily, hopefully it was taken down. Yeah. So any other questions, maybe to pedagogy or. Any any other questions? Okay, Camille asked, what has it been like for you to teach this topic given your own positionality, how you show up in the classroom? Good question. Yeah, this is a great question because I I I'm a person from Latin America and I am uh, I am Latina in the U.S. So I am a person that speaks Spanish and in in that actually uh, people can see that I that I speak a foreign language that I am not from here. But at the same at the same time I'm, I'm white and I live in this country as a, a white person. So. Uh, 
so yeah, I mean, I, I introduce myself as, as a white person and from a country that actually was created also, you know, that, that, is, that is a very interesting question because you're having Brazil that construct their racial relations in one way, and then you're having Argentina that has you know, a different way of <laughs> creating, right? They, uh, and, and that was constructed basically as a white nation, right? And, and, and I think that me, myself, you know, in this, you know, um, and, I am, and I am actually the embodiment of that project, I would say. So I think that that is, that is the way in which I present into that class. So, you know, even my surname, you know, um, my surname, uh, Rigi, is, is an Italian surname. So I am a consequence of the mass migration, uh, mass migration to 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 the country. So this is, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not planning to speak on behalf, of course, of uh, of black women from my country uh, or from Brazil. Um, I'm actually interested, you know, how this. Uh, this connection could be made. I know that the feminist movement actually tended to exclude them. So also as a person who considers herself a feminist, I mean, I need to embrace also that past. And, uh, and yes, this is, I think that this is how I try to introduce myself in the classroom to introduce this component of whiteness, right? That whiteness is also a racialized identity, right? That it was created, right, to be uh, in, a, in a dominant position. But I, yeah, I, I try to introduce myself like that in, in, in the classroom. So I, I know that I am, that I live in the US and that I have like, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, and that I am a white person and that I circulate among different spaces uh, in this way. So, so yeah, I know. And, and this is also complicated because generally the Latino identity here in the US is not closely connected to whiteness. So yeah, that is, that is something else to, to, to talk about. But I think that I, I would like to try to go into that direction and see how is to speak about uh, uh, Black women, about the suffering of others, right? Like I think it's kind of like a, philosophical question so like you know the suffering of other that is not mine and that it will never be mine um so so yeah it's i think that i i, I leave it as a as a question right that I, I that i permanently you know ask myself right um so yeah all right so any others uh, i know we have reached just after eight o'clock um, but any other questions as I think we wrap up, if I'm correct, Laura? That is absolutely right. If there is not one more question to finish up the evening, then we will give Dr. Rigi another round of applause and thank her for this evening and this contribution to the Hidden Truths series and say take care and be well and good night y'all okay thank you so much for everything and i hope you have a great night and thank you to my students who are great muchas gracias <laughs>